Okay, everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Such Egan, and I'm really excited and honored to be your host today. Um, a lot of folks here in Mountain View, so thanks for coming out. Good afternoon to you all. I know we've got a lot of Googlers tuning in around the country and even around the world, so good day to you as well. Um, I'll introduce Dr. Hanscom in a minute, but first I'll just begin by telling you that like many folks in this room, I suffer from back pain and I have for a few years. And a few years ago, I finally decided, hey, I want to think about surgery. I went to all of the top clinics throughout the Bay Area and every single one recommended surgery immediately. So I was even scheduled, I think, two or three times within that same week to get surgery. I'd heard about Dr. Hanscom's book, and so I picked that up. I read it in about a week, and it immediately became a top three favorite book all time for me for a lot of reasons that don't even have to do with back pain. So um, I'm sorry we're out of the free books in the back, but definitely encourage you to check it out. So um, Dr. Hanscom will talk a little bit more about his method, which is also available on his website, backincontrol.com. Um, but I should also let you know that uh, Dr. Hanscom is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon with Swedish neuroscience specialists based out of Seattle. And his work uh, focuses complex spine deformities and issues in all areas of the spine. Um, a lot of his practice, as he'll probably mention, is with folks who've had multiple previous surgeries and are still having problems. So he's got a really cool story personally himself and also in his work that he'll share. Um, without further ado, round of applause for Dr. Hanscom, please. Thank you, Serge. I want to thank you very much for having me come up. I met him a, about a year ago, I think, and he was not necessarily a believer in what we were talking about initially. In fact, I remember the conversation very well. But um, it's a up and down process. It's not hard. It's very consistent with time and repetition. You see pretty quickly this is a programming issue. That's it. Pain originates in the brain. I have some good news and I have some bad news for you. The bad news is that probably, I estimate, 70% of spine surgery should never be done. And such a story is typical right now in the American medical culture. And it's actually damaging people in creating disability and pain, not solving it. I think the medical profession right now is a major factor in creating disability and chronic pain. The good news is that the neuroscience research has revealed to us the answer to the problem. So it turns out that chronic pain is very solvable. I've watched hundreds of patients go to pain-free using very simple self-directed measures. I'd like to introduce you to one of my successes, Dr. Mark Owens, and this is his video. Broke my back in two places and crushed my entire left chest in and punctured my lung. I had to be medevaced to Kalispell Medical Center in Montana where they fused my spine from my um, thoracic 9 to lumbar 2. The pain got worse and worse mm -hmm. and I had to take more and more opiates to control the pain. Not so bad that uh, I couldn't stand it anymore. Refused my lumbar two to my lumbar three, everything from Norco to Oxycontin, Oxycodone, uh, Ultram, um, muscle relaxers, sleeping aids because I couldn't sleep, um, and um, the pain wouldn't go away. You be you become socially isolated by your pain because people don't want to see you suffer like that. Pain that probably went from seven to ten all the time. At times it was so bad I couldn't stand it. I would just, um, frankly, I got to a point where I wanted to die. It was... Wow. Well, finally I went to a surgeon in Spokane, Washington, and uh, he breezed into the room and said he'd looked at my charts and everything. And the only thing that was going to do me any good was <laughs> what he called the blue plate special. He said, it's going to take two surgeries. It'll take probably at least a full day and probably two days. And uh, 
We're going to break your back in two places. We're going to clean out all the stenosis in your spinal canal and in your nerve root canals and on and on and on. And I said, in the end, he said, we're going to fuse you from your collarbone to your hips. And I said, but I won't. Well, I, you know, he said, it's not a good option. But he said, it's the only one that will work for you. you uh -huh. Your back's a mess. I need another opinion. And so I, I got an appointment with um, a Dr. David Hansen at Swedish Medical and um, in Seattle and went to see him. And he said, I see nothing in your spine that would cause the pain you're feeling. It's like the phantom limb syndrome. People who have amputees often feel the same pain after an amputee after a limb that is giving them pain is amputated, as they did before they lost the limb. And it's, again, the rewiring of the brain. He said, what I'm pioneering along with some other physicians, a, um, a, t a, a program that will provide an alternative to having yet more um, spinal fusions. And he explained that only around... 15 to 30 percent it at the most of spinal surgery of uh, fusions are ever successful in alleviating pain over even over the near term let alone long term and so he said you i would like you to try my program i said well what does it consist of and he said well the first thing you can do is read my book on the subject and but he said immediately you can start what we call expressive writing and I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, you sit down and 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night, and you write down every negative thought you have about anything in longhand, and you tear it up, and you throw it away. And yeah. I said, what? <laughs> First of all, I said, that sounds like snake oil. I was really honest with it. I said, I'm a... I'm a career scientist, and I'm taught to be a critical thinker, and very, and I'm by nature skeptical anyway. So, I frankly think this sounds like snake oil. And he said, "Well, you can think what you want." He said politely, but he said you can always be filleted like a salmon. <laughs> and he said there'll be plenty of surgeons who'll do that, but I won't. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, um, "Or you can try this this technique, and 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 the whole program eventually." I said to my friend, I mean, this really sounds unbelievable. And um, I said, like the doctor said, I can always be filleted. I'll just try it. So we drove down the coast with, from Seattle and stayed in a motel at night. And and that night I actually did some of this so-called creative writing. And uh, I, I woke up the next morning and... The pain I was feeling, which and maybe I should back up a little. When you live with pain like this, it's like you have a leech attached to your body or a monkey on your back that you can't get rid of. It's always there. It's always you're always thinking about it. You don't you don't realize, but it preoccupies every aspect of your being. I woke up that morning after doing this first session of, of creative writing, and the first thing I noticed is that I didn't have that monkey on that leech and I couldn't I didn't even first I forgot my even done the negative writing or the pretty writing the night before and I thought what's what's going on here you know this is this is great it still hurts but it's nothing like it was mm -hmm. to cut it make the long story short and after another 24 hours I was 85 percent pain free 85 percent pain free and today um, what, three years later, more or less, I, yes, I have pain, but it's pain that's easily controllable with a Tylenol, and sometimes I'll go through three weeks or more without even taking a Tylenol, and I'm living a reasonably normal life, a fairly active life, riding horses, chainsawing, cutting wood, you know, doing physical things. And they do make my back uncomfortable, but I don't have this debilitating, crippling pain. Basically, by visiting Dr. Hanston, I, I got my life back.
when he was a child here for nine solid years. He has sought every imaginable cure possible. He's seen over 30 physicians. He had two high-level surgeons recommend a fusion from his neck to his pelvis. The complication rate of that operation is about 70%, with half of those being major. The chance of actually solving his pain with that surgery is about 20 to 25%. So within six weeks, he was pain-free. He and I have become good friends along with my wife, and he's fine. He, just, he lives a normal life. And if any of us did half the work that he did at age 72, our backs would be killing us. He's fine. So visualize what his life would have been like if he'd had that 12 hours of surgery, high dose narcotics, it, it would have been a big problem. So the purpose of my talk today is to show you that this is not magic, this is not a belief system, this is basically every human being has their own capacity to heal, every one of us. From an evolutionary standpoint, that would make sense, right? The key is Mark somehow quickly found his capacity to heal. I hear the story all the time. This is not an unusual story. I've watched hundreds and hundreds of patients go to pain-free, not managing the pain, but actually solving the pain. So it is my belief and I'm sort of a technophobe, I got to have to tell you this, but I believe that one of the most basic needs that makes us human is to be in charge of our destiny with a sense of worth. Successfully treating patients suffering from chronic pain requires reconnecting them with their vision and their purpose in life. When you're in chronic pain and suffering, you become completely disconnected. So what happened to Mark? So as a physician, when we walk into the office, when we give lectures ever since I've been a resident, there's, quote, the ideal patient. That means they're employed, they're not a disability, they're motivated, they're smart, they're intelligent. He was all of those, okay? What happened? And so what we do as surgeons, we think, well, we can figure this out in the clinic, but remember, we're in a volume schedule, we're in a busy clinic, we have 10 to 15 minutes, maybe half an hour at the most. And remember, two surgeons made a diagnosis or recommendation for a 12-hour surgery on the first visit. The first visit. Okay? That's a big deal. Such had recommendations for surgery for back pain. Were those on the first visit also many times? And often patients come to me saying, well, the surgeons really had an urgency to do this operation. And they try to sign them up right there in the office. So the research is two papers, this is one of them, where surgeons actually, it's been documented, the surgeons have a limited ability to assess risk. So the DRAM is a risk assessment score, depression, anxiety, what's called somatization, where you can focus on your body. So they gave this test to 125 orthopedic patients prospectively, and they identified 54 patients at risk, and 35 of those patients were actually distressed. So then they asked the surgeons to rate their patients about how much at risk this person was, they were correct 26% of the time. That's it. And it didn't matter if you were a medical student or a senior attending, they couldn't tell in clinic who was at risk, couldn't do it. So with Mark, what the physicians didn't see is that he had been in Africa for 23 years. He was very idealistic. He went off into the wilderness with his wife without even a gun. The animals were so wild that they had never even seen a human being. But he's idealistic. He didn't understand the risk. So the corruption he was dealing with with the poachers was unbelievable. Went right went all the way to the top. He's flying helicopters and airplanes without navigation. He had bad weather. His wife never knew that if he's coming back or not. And he had three assassination attempts, three assassination attempts. That's stress. Then he came home and bought a 700-acre 700, 700 ranch and created a preserve for grizzly bears and wolves, which, of course, didn't make him incredibly popular with the local ranchers, et cetera. So stress continued. But see, for somebody like Mark and myself, and I'm guessing most of the people that's in this room, the stress is just what you do, right? 
I mean, isn't one of our badges of honor we just do stress? So Mark didn't think that was a problem, except it's been documented over and over and over again, over 100 years, by the way, that your body doesn't lie. So even though you intellectually suppress the stress and keep plowing forward, you're tough, you're resilient, you can take it. Again, that's a badge of honor, particularly for surgeons. We're suppressing things like crazy, and our body is creating symptoms. So I want to explain to you the basic neurophysiology before I go into the rest of the story about what happened to Mark, is that I view the nervous system as a junction box, and every one of us in this room, every second, is interpreting sensory input to figure out what's going on. The temperature, the shape of the chair, the doors. The only reason your brain says that's a chair, I'm sorry, the only reason you recognize that's a chair is your, your brain taking visual signals, unscramble those, and said that's a chair. Well, that's a chair too. That's a different chair. So your brain is comparing everything every second. Same thing with pain. This is not painful only because my brain says it's not painful. So the sum total of the nervous system I call the junction box. So all these senses are vision, touch, feel, sound, taste, smell with the obvious, the various organs. But there's nothing about your nose that can smell anything. If you, if you disconnect the nose from the brain, they're just receptors. That's it. Your brain has to unscramble the signals. There's also another sensation we don't think about much. It's called interoception, where if your stomach's full, bladder's full, etc., your body's also sensing those sensations also. The sum total of these every second is competing for attention. On the other side, there can be a total either of either pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. And if it's pleasant, your body's going to secrete reward chemicals like oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, the Valium type drugs, the GABA drugs. And if it's unpleasant, your body's going to be tight, tense, trying to avoid danger. It's going to secrete adrenaline, cortisol, endorphins, histamines, different stress chemicals. Then you feel anxiety. But when you feel the positive drugs, you feel relaxed, right? It's not just, I feel relaxed. You actually feel relaxed. When you feel the unpleasant chemicals, you actually feel anxiety. Therefore, anxiety is simply a chemical reaction to the environment. That's it. End of the story. The reason it's so critical to understand anxiety is simply a chemical response to the environment is that the unconscious brain, of which every living creature has, is a million times stronger than the human brain, than the consciousness. So the unconscious brain is a million one ratio of unconscious reactions to the conscious brain. So you can't stop it. You can't control it. So anxiety is part of the unconscious survival reflex that you can't control. What happens is your body, the way your brain's programmed evolutionary-wise, is that your behavior is governed in a way where you stay in a range where you're not looking at bright lights. Um, that, was not a, that was a mistake. <laughs> or you're not know, putting your hand on hot stoves because your body says that's a danger. So the nociceptive system or the pain system actually keeps you out of pain. It doesn't produce pain. Okay, So that's what the whole behavior is gauged around sensory input. So why is it so persistent? Okay, you avoid the behaviors, et cetera. You stay in a neutral range. Why is it so persistent? So the problem is that Shakespeare may have been the first neuroscientist where he's pointed out there is nothing either good or bad. The thinking makes it so. So humans have a major problem called consciousness, right? We're the only species that have consciousness. So the, re the recent neuroscience research the last two years has been stunning because what it shows is that thoughts go to the same area of the brain. You get the same chemical response. So pleasant thoughts give you reward chemicals. You feel relaxed. Unpleasant thoughts give you unpleasant chemicals and anxiety. But there's a major problem. You can't escape your thoughts. So no matter who you're talking to, people say, I'm not anxious. And actually, that was me until I was 38 years old. I'm not anxious. Because we're so good at masking it and not recognizing it and not acknowledging it that we think it's not there. Every living creature has anxiety. Again, thoughts are a problem. So we suffer with the thoughts. They get worse as we get older. Again, it's a programming issue. We have all sorts of masking behaviors like addictions. And one of my favorite ones is being a workaholic. And uh, I like to think that's not an addiction. So I, I told my daughter one day, she said, look, I'm not a workaholic. She goes, really? I go, yeah. I said, I really, really enjoy what I do. And she looks at me and goes, well, every addict likes their drug. 
So, okay. Okay, okay, touche, there you go. Nothing like having kids, right? And then suppressing is what I did. That's how I became a major spine surgeon. I went to one of the top spine fellowships in the world. I didn't have anxiety. I didn't get there by having anxiety. I get there by suppressing it at the level you can't imagine and just bring it on. And I'm guessing a lot of people in this room have the same, I use the word gunner mode, but just bring it on, right? I can take this. The problem is with repetition, whether you suffer, suppress, or mask, you get this repetition going where these pathways or circuits become programmed in your brain and they become permanent. So it's just like riding a bicycle is that once you know how to ride a bicycle, how do you unlearn how to ride a bicycle? Right? You can, the skill can drop down with disuse, but all of us know how to ride a bicycle that learn how to ride a bicycle. Then the pain, research, the pain circuitry reinforces repetition. So there's a book I have people read called The Talent Code, which is about artists, athletes, and musicians. And with deep repetition, you actually learn neurological circuits that are repeated, right? But it's very specific repetitions over very specific moves. It's how you learn genius. So pain pathways are like that in that they're very specific. They're coming from one part of the body. The repetition is very fast, so they become reinforced and permanent very quickly, much faster than a professional athlete or musician learning a skill. And so they get reinforced with repetition. It's a programming problem. So then you have the situation now where you can't escape your thoughts. If somebody has a different approach, let me know, between suffer, suppressing, and masking. I've actually asked audiences for decades and not found an answer to that. That's all we know what to do. So what happens, you're in a continuous chemical assault. The research, term, the research term is called unpleasant repetitive thoughts, URTs. So what you, what's happening is that everybody in this room is under a greater or lesser degree of an adrenaline storm. We're being assaulted by our own body chemistry. And it gets worse as you get older. So then the problem becomes even worse because what happened to your anxiety if you held your hand over a stone? It would go up, right? And what would you do? Okay, so what would happen to your anxiety if I took your hand and grabbed it and forced you to hold it over the stove? What would be your next reaction? Yeah, you'd be angry, right? So it turns out the anxiety and anger are the same thing. So it's a survival response. The antidote to anxiety is control. You either control the situation or avoid it to control it. Anxiety is solved. When you're trapped by anything, your body kicks in more chemistry to solve the problem, right? So basically, anger is anxiety on steroids. It's just a cranked up body chemistry. So we're trapped by your thoughts, a problem. Then you get trapped by your pain, another problem. Both are equally a problem. And what happens, Dr. Sarno years ago called this the rage. And what happens, your body is really full of stress chemicals. I'm using just adrenaline as one of the representations of the stress chemicals, because we all know what adrenaline is all about. But you have this really high level of adrenaline by being trapped by anything, circumstances, finances, relationships, pain, thoughts, whatever they are. When you're trapped, your body's cranked up, right? So what happens is like driving your car down the freeway in a low gear, second or third gear, your engine, your RPMs are five, six, seven thousand. You're driving down the freeway. What happens? It's going to break down. So what happens in the human body is that every organ system is now bathed in a chemical environment. And what happens is that there's over 30 symptoms of a cranked up nervous system. This is probably a conservative list. Migraine headaches, tinnitus, burning sensations around the body, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, depression, PTSD, chronic tendonitis, obsessive thought patterns, irritable bowel syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder, acid reflex, different back pains, neck pains, chest pains, skin rashes, itchiness in the scalp, tension headaches, heart sensations, eating issues, and spastic bladder. This is not a complete list, but just want you to stop for a second and think about this. Okay, your body's cranked up, you're trapped by your thoughts, you're trapped by your pain, trapped by your job, whatever it is you're trapped by, you're not very happy. So the chemical consequences of being trapped are high Remember, each organ system secretes its own chemicals. Each organ system is going to respond in its own way. That's why there's so many symptoms. So what happened to Mark? Okay, so normally it sounds like a big operation on my book, his back, get thrown from a horse, 
he almost froze to death the night before, et cetera, right? So it sounds like, well, you know, chronic pain would be sort of logical, right? No? Big injury, big surgery. So I do this, I do this surgery every week. The normal postoperative course is two days of misery, a week in between. By two weeks, the surgical pain is gone, and by three months, people are fine. So you can see the bruising on his side there from the broken ribs. He's got a nice, nicely healed surgical scar. So if this had happened 20 years earlier, the chances, of, the chances of him going into chronic pain would have been almost zero. This is not the normal post-operative course. So what happened? So there's a paper in Chicago, which is fascinating, which was published in 2013, is that they took a group of volunteers, they did these research MRI scans on the brain, they found out that with back pain, that there's a, that there's a certain part of the brain that lights up every time, consistent, called the nociceptive center. So they took patients or volunteers with back pain for less than two months, and they saw that, saw that the pain center lit up like it should. Then they took people with chronic back pain for more than 10 years, and the pain center was quiet. There was no activity in the pain center on these people with chronic back pain. Guess where the, guess where the center of activity was? It was in the emotional center. And it completely shifted from the emotional center to the, I'm sorry, from the pain center to the emotional center in about 12 months. It happened to every patient every time. So we all know about phantom limb pain, which is fascinating. And from medical school on, it's been sort of glossed over in my training, but it's a big deal. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've done many amputations. It's sort of a disturbing process to take a limb and put it into a bucket. So you know where the pain's coming from. It's completely gone. Over half the patients feel the leg and they feel the pain. What's wrong with that picture? That's a big deal. So what happens is that the pain is still there with the back pain, for instance, but again, it can happen in any part of the body. The pain is still there, but it's a different driver. So instead of being the pain center, it's now the emotional center. The other thing I illustrate a lot with is that when you turn a light switch on, where's the light? It's at the light, it's not at the switch, right? So when the pain center in the brain is turned on, whether it's from the emotional source or the pain center, the pain is gonna be here, not in your brain. So we know there's plenty of risk factors for poor outcomes. There is younger age, being female, the length of the pain, the severity of the injury, anxiety, depression, catastrophizing, fear avoidance, high dose narcotics. All those are major risk factors. Oh, sleep, a huge one. Those are all major risk factors for poor surgical outcomes. And I've known that for over 30 years. It's been in the medical literature for over 60 years. It's been there a long time. We know this. From medical school on, we're told if you take a patient who's stressed out, they don't talk about the body chemistry, by the way. By the way, I'm just curious, how many people learned about adrenaline in high school? Can you raise your hands? I'm just curious. Okay. So that, that to me, that's why I'm a little perplexed where the medical system has missed this because you're under stress for any reason, your body's full of adrenaline, right? So the research paper out of Baltimore showed that only 10% of orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons were assessing these risk factors before they did surgery. And guess what? The outcomes were all over the map. In fact, the outcomes were very bad when these risk factors weren't addressed. So the definition of chronic pain now from the, this is from Chicago, but this, the neuroscience, center, neuroscience centers around the world are coming to this common definition that chronic pain is an embedded memory that becomes linked with more and more life experiences and the memory can't be erased. Okay? And there's another saying that neuroscientists have that neurons that fire together, wire together. So if you have back pain when you climb, climb a certain set of steps, again, anytime, every time you climb those steps, your brain links that with pain, right? So this is not psychological. This is simply a direct link with a chemical response. It has nothing to do with psychology. So how many, again, I'm going to ask people to raise their hands. How many people are sort of given the idea that surgery is sort of the definitive solution? Is that a common belief amongst this crowd a little bit? So in doctors it is. I mean, when I first started my training for the first seven or eight years, I felt like as a surgeon, you had suffered for a long time. I felt obligated, literally obligated, to find a solution to your problem. What else do you do? You've tried everything else, and so no matter what happens, you're going to try to find a reason to solve the problem, right? Well, 
Really? So here's some, here's some of the data. So the problem is you're using a structural solution for a neurological diagnosis, right? You're way off target. It can't work. It just can't work. And guess what? It doesn't work. So there's just, this is just one of many. So the analogy I like to use is that of going to the dentist with a cavity that's painful. You know where the problem is. The dentist either pulls a tooth or fills the cavity or crown. Problem solved, right? Happens almost 100% of the time. But if you go to the dentist with mouth pain and you don't know where the problem is and you start filling teeth, pulling teeth, whatever, the chances of success are very, very low. With back pain, we actually don't know where the pain's coming from. We know where the pain's coming from literally 15% of the time, one five. So you start doing these big procedures on something that you don't know what the solution is. Spinal surgery has a terrible reputation and it actually is deserved. So surgery works extremely well for a structural problem. We do lots, I do lots of surgery. We have a high success rate, but I can see what we're doing. You can't fix something you can't see. What I did know until a few years ago, this data has actually been around for a while, is that when you have chronic pain in your nervous system and you do surgery in another part of the body, you can create, you can create chronic pain in the new body part. So let's take our, our hernia repair, which is a very straightforward surgery. And say you've had chronic neck pain for five years, the hernia goes beautifully. You can induce chronic pain at the hernia site between five to 60% of the time. And up to 4% of the, the time, it can become permanent. Surgeons aren't taught this. I wasn't. Patients aren't really told that chronic pain can be a complication of a simple, well-performed surgery. And it's a big deal. So in defense of the surgeons, when you talk about a blue page special, that's all we're trained to do. And we're not really taught about chronic pain. We're not, about, we're not taught about sleep, stress. Actually, we sort of know about it. But the surgeons, the way we become compartmentalized as specialists, we're responsible for this part of the problem, but not the whole part of the problem. And so there's been a real disconnect. So the physicians are well-intentioned, but the business of medicine has made it very difficult for us to actually take time to talk to and listen to the patients. So with Mark's situation, I will admit at that first visit, I did not know his background, but it was easy for him because I never ever make a surgical decision on the first visit, ever. I don't know you, you don't know me, I don't know the circumstances. The last 10 years, I've learned a lot that when people are under stress, the body chemistry changes and symptoms start arising that had not arisen before. So with Mark, it was actually pretty simple because he did not have a surgical lesion. How many people here have been told that degenerative disc, disc disease is a problem? Anybody heard that? The, okay. So we don't know where back pain comes from most of the time, but we actually know, it's been well documented, that arthritis, bulging disc, herniated disc, degenerated disc actually don't cause pain. They are not a source of pain. Is that surprising to anybody? It's a problem because your spine becomes stiffer Okay, but it is not, it's been well documented that it is not a source of pain yet. It is a reason to do surgery in over 500,000 people per year right now. The estimate by 2020, it'll be up over a million people per year getting spine fusions. So with Marco, simple. He's got some disc degeneration. He has some arthritis here, 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 and here. Here's his rods down in through here. I need to point up to, there's another one. So we're to... <laughs> anyway, he has, he has arthritis on the left side. He's got some narrowing of the disc, and that's spine. So that's a normal spine for somebody who's 68 years old, flat out normal. Okay, if anyone if any one of you had narrowing skin out of your spine, especially those without pain, you're going to have degeneration. It is not a source of pain. So Mark's case is pretty simple for me. So I'm just picking one study out of many. This was done in 2006 out of Stanford here that they took patients who had unstable spine actually moving back and forth about four millimeters, which surgeons consider a source of pain, and they fused them. They found out the success, the success rate was 72% at two years, which to me is lower than it should be. I mean, to me, it should be 100%. But then they did this disc study where they injected the dye into the disc. The disc was painful. Then they would fuse it. They did one-level fusions. They found out that the success rate was 27%. Other papers show 15%. 22%, 24%. There's not one paper, not one paper that says that a fusion works for back pain. 
Not one. So right now it's a $13 billion a year industry. So I stopped doing surgery in 1993 for back pain. I quit doing infusion for back pain in 1993, but I didn't know what to do. I mean, what do I do? So I was a surgeon. I was trained to do fusion. I felt guilt if I didn't find a reason to do the fusion. And so what happened, I learned it the hard way. So I became a chronic pain sufferer for over 15 years. That's how this book evolved was my own ordeal with chronic pain. And I had 16 of those symptoms I mentioned before. I had ringing in my ears, burning feet, skin rashes, itching scalp, insomnia, anxiety, OCD, you name it, I had it. I had no idea what was going on. No idea. And nobody could tell me. So I became desperate. I had no hope. I didn't know what was going on. And by pure luck, I ran across this recommendation by Dr. David Burns here at Stanford, by the way. And he and I have become pretty good friends. And Jeff has been nice enough to introduce me to him again. Is that David Burns wrote a book called Feeling Good. And David Burns said to start writing. So I started writing, writing his technique. And initially thought it was the book. But I later found out it was actually the writing. There's over 300 research papers that document that expressive writing, different forms of it, work. They break up all sorts, of pain, all sorts of pain cycles. Performance goes up, grades go up, asthma improves, skin heals faster. It's unbelievable, and nobody knows why it works, but there's way more data on this than there is on spine surgery. So basically, it's on my website. You simply write down your thoughts, tear them up. And you tear them up for two reasons. First of all, you cannot control your thoughts, but you can separate from them. You've heard the philosophers say for centuries that you're not your thoughts, and they use meditation to separate. I call this mechanical meditation, where you write down your thoughts. There's a space between you and your thoughts. That space is now connected with vision and feel, which is part of the unconscious brain. And the reason why you rip them up is for two reasons. One is to write with freedom. By the way, it can be positive or negative thoughts. Most of the research has been done on negative thoughts, but it doesn't really matter. But the other reason that you rip them up, which is more important, is that if you want to analyze and fix these things, where is your attention, right? It's on the thoughts. So I still do it 20 years later. If I quit doing my writing exercises, the first thing that happens is my wife asks me, goes, she goes, honey, have you been doing your writing? Because <laughs> we tend both to get a little bit snappy when we don't do it because we get anxious. And I don't sleep as well. These little skin rashes pop up. So about two weeks, almost to the day, if I quit my writing exercises, which I do maybe one or two minutes is all it takes, it's like brushing your teeth. It's really simple, right? So with neuroplasticity, you want to do awareness, separation. Then you want to redirect. It's like directing a river into different channels. So you want to come off the pain circuits into a different set of circuits. So things like visualization, good food, good wine, good friends, meditation, that's the revisualization tool. So you have a situation now where you have chronic pain, you have an adrenalized nervous system, you can't escape your thoughts, surgery is not going to work, these are permanent pathways, it doesn't sound that good, right? Okay? And the harder you try to fix it, your attention on the pathways, it makes it worse. So it's a solvable problem, but you have, you have to first understand that traditional ways of solving it can't and don't work. So I'm just going to give you a couple principles. So why is chronic pain so hard to treat? Well, again, we're using a structural interventions for a neurological problem. So we're treating symptoms, we're not treating the root cause. We're doing surgery, injections, medications. And what's fascinating and disturbing both is that most of the interventions we do for chronic pain have been documented not to work. There's no doubt to support enough drills for back pain. There's no data supporting facet rhizotomies for back pain. We know about opioids, that's a big problem. So everything we do in the medical profession right now has actually been documented not to work, including spine surgery. We don't have the diagnosis correct. Even though the neuroscience has shown us the diagnosis, this has not penetrated mainstream medical thinking. The other problem is that we've been throwing simplistic random solutions to a complicated problem. And I know everybody in this room is used to dealing with complexity and trying to solve complexity, right? And a friend of mine introduced me to the complexity theory, and I'll admit I only know the term. But chronic pain is complicated. There's multiple things that affect chronic pain. So we're randomly throwing this at it, throwing this at it, and it can't work. So it's like fighting a forest fire. It takes multiple strategies to contain this place, right? A fire hose isn't going to do it. 
Bulldozer, bulldozers alone aren't going to do it. It is a multi-pronged approach to solve it, and everything counts. So what happens with this relentless thought assault, we're continually adrenalized, we have these unpleasant thoughts, the adrenalized nervous system, in which in the two strategies or two principles behind solving the problem is to simply de the nervous system. So everybody sit back for a second, drop your shoulders, just feel the chair you're in, that's it. So what you've done is simply switch sensory input, instead of being on racing thoughts or unpleasant sensations, you just went to a different sensation, that's it, three to five seconds, I call it active meditation, to decrease the adrenaline just a little bit, as you do it repetitively throughout the day, it keeps the adrenaline levels coming down, and eventually comes somewhat automatic, I like to do it more, it's my personal commitment. And the other principle is called neuroplasticity, which remember I said awareness, separation, redirecting, again like redirecting a river to a different channel, and that's awareness, separation, reprogramming. And so that's the second principle. The third one is shifting. So pain pathways are permanent. You can't solve them. So the writing allows you to separate and then you redirect. So you can shift onto play pathways. And those of you in chronic pain probably, was, I suspect, the life isn't nearly as much fun as it used to be before you had chronic pain, right? It's a problem. So you can't solve chronic pain but as you quit using those pathways, they start to atrophy, just like any skill. And you start reinforcing the creative, enjoyable pathways, you start to grow. And at some tipping point, people come off these pathways and go onto the pleasant pathways. It's very, very consistent. So what we do, we tend to run from pain, we're trying to fight it, whatever. And the essence of the problem is the more you fight and try to treat chronic pain and just try to conquer it, again, it's a million to one ratio, you can't do it, you actually give it more neurological attention, and it's a problem. So the essence of the solution is becoming comfortable, again, a learned skill, with uncomfortable sensations. Whether they're thoughts, anxiety, anger, you've got to be okay being angry. You've got to be okay being anxious. You just train your body just not to react. In other words, you start decreasing the adrenaline, the body's nerve conduction improves, so the anxiety drops dramatically. That's the most fun part of this process, by the way and then the pain starts, starts to improve. So I call this a ring of fire. Um, we're trained that we don't, to avoid anxiety. So the red ring represents anger, anxiety, disgust, vulnerability, et cetera, and we hate it. This is a survival set of feelings. So what we do, we spend a lifetime trying to achieve, accomplish, own, experience, whatever it is, to stay in this blue ring to avoid the red ring. So look at this when you go home, it's on the website. And think about it, I realized, that, I realized at one point I would spend my entire life in the blue ring, and I would touch the red ring and pop right out into the blue ring. I was so much in the blue ring, I actually didn't even know the red ring existed. So when I, by force, was forced to go through the red ring into the center, as you become comfortable with uncomfortable feelings, where, the, where you end up is in the green, which is the center, safe, content, and you're not burning adrenaline. And I probably have triple the energy I had in high school, and I had plenty back then, because I'm not burning adrenaline all the time. So we're taught you can have it all, right? We have all these opportunities, and the problem is you cannot run your mind. So what we are taught to do is that we're trying to make ourselves better people, and it's like climbing a huge mountain. At the top of this mountain, there's a better you, right? And so you learn, you become enlightened, you meditate, you do mindfulness, all this type of stuff, but there's no top to the mountain. You tell me you have an ideal picture of who you should be or could be in your brain, and you're climbing and climbing and climbing, but there's no top, right? So what you're doing with these tools, if you just picture a bunch of balloons tied to a railing, what the tools do, they cut the strings. And pretty soon you get to take off, which takes no energy, right? And where do you go? There's no place to go. You don't have to go anyplace, right? You're just there. What happens, you get to be creative again. Pain becomes sort of a distant memory. And you're free. So you can't solve chronic pain. These are permanent unconscious survival skills, but you can move into a different realm. So the details are all in my book, Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. And I learned this the hard way, literally a millimeter at a time. Then the website, I recommend actually people hop on first and just go to stage one. You'll see a sequence that over the next six to 12 months, as you start walking through the sequence, it's not a fixing process. It's not a formula. 
It's not a one, two, three in your fix, but it's a set of concepts that break, it's a framework that breaks pain into its different parts that allows you to address each part on your own terms. You take control. And at some tipping point, you simply go to pain free, and it's very, very consistent. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. You have time for QA, right, Dr. Hanscom? Pardon? You have time for question and answer? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I'll just kick things off. I've got one from New York. Okay. okay. And the question is Does your approach work for all kinds of back pain? And if not, can you give examples where it doesn't work as well? So we found out that I used to think that surgical lesions like bone, like spinal stenosis and bone spurs had to have surgery to solve it. And it turns out that it doesn't matter where the pain comes from. So it's a structural problem or a non-structural problem, but it doesn't matter. So the answer is yes, it works for any type of pain. What we do though, um, we do what we call a prehab process. And if you're my patient, say, look, maybe we do surgery on your back. We're gonna calm you down first and your outcomes have been spectacular. So yeah, the, the, the solution, so I actually had almost 100 patients that were on the schedule to have surgery that came in for the final visit, they canceled their surgery. The pain went away. So that has been completely unexpected. So it's actually been devastating to my practice. So it's a little awkward at this moment. That's good to hear. I guess a follow-up would be something that I haven't asked you before is, is there's a certain level of anxiety that's perhaps natural. It's not the kind that you would go see a therapist for or that somebody would say is abnormal. Right. At what point do you have a patient maybe and you might not want to do surgery on them because you know they don't have a problem in their spine that warrants surgery. You can tell that they're anxious, but it's an appropriate amount. Like, do you have something you would say to those types of people? Well, first of all, if you didn't have anxiety, you would die. So this is not about getting rid of anxiety. It's not about suppressing anxiety. It's being comfortable to use the cues to actually take safe action. So, I mean, there's no definition when anxiety becomes a problem. I mean, in other words, if it's disruptive to you, then it's a problem, right? So again, it's not trying to solve it or control it. It's simply letting it go. And I talk about moving forward with your pain, which means anxiety. By the way, I didn't make this clear in the lecture. Mental pain and physical pain are processed the same way. Anxiety is the pain, okay? So you're not trying to get rid of it or solve it, but you, as you quit paying attention to it and trying to do battle with it, it simply starts to atrophy. And so, yeah, anxiety is something that's life. Anger is part of life. You're not going to get rid of that. Thank you. Hi. Um, your comments about um, adrenaline, um, Makes me really curious because uh, from my experience, I've found that adrenaline actually helps with the pain uh, in the sense that it kind of like watches it out or, you know, makes me forget about it. Uh, is that because I'm on the blue ring, let's say? Yep. <laughs> but, but let me talk about that. That was interesting. I, I, did, I mean, 20 years ago, I had a patient come in who we talked about this process. And I didn't have a project back then, but I had some sense that there's some things going on here. So he was an incredibly angry guy. Not that you're angry. I don't know you. But... Let's just take perfectionism for a second. All of us have high standards, right? We think that's the right thing to do. Well, the problem is a genealogy of anger where you have a situation that you blame, that you're a victim, and then you're angry. So with perfectionism, which is being self-critical, you have perfection, which you'll never achieve. So you're either happy with the situation or yourself of being less than perfect. So you're always a victim, you're always frustrated, and you're always angry and frustrated. So Dr. Burns pointed out the delta or the difference between reality and your vision of perfection, I'm sorry, your vision of perfection reality is how unhappy you're going to become. So what happens in that situation is you're always adrenalized. So what happens, I used to be, quote, successful, right? I went to the top, top level spine fellowship. I was successful, made money, had a beautiful house. And the same adrenaline drive that took me up the hill took me right down the other side. It's hard to let go of because we used to adrenaline. It does, quote, make us successful on paper. I also have 19 medical colleagues death in suicide. Doctors have double the suicide rate of the average population. And suicide is not a depression response, it's an anger response. Because anger is destructive. The ultimate act of destruction is self-destruction. So I can give you hundreds of stories amongst my colleagues of people self-destructing. Is that successful? So yeah, get your, your adrenaline, you can get you, you can get a lot done with adrenaline, and we do. But does that give you a relaxing, content, fulfilled life? That's the question. Got it. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know, so if, let's say, a person has chronic pain, how do they diagnose whether it is structural or mental? So, again, this, this holds for all pain, migraine, headaches, whatever it is. So, 
since I've taken the paint project, I'm hyper about doing a workup. In other words, I want to make sure it's not a tumor or infection or something causing the problem. But what I'm seeing with these patients with surgical problems, those were structural problems. And historically, I would have done surgery in a heartbeat, even by my conservative standards. And they would have done pretty well. But some of them wouldn't. So what happens, I tease my fellows about this, when, when was the last time you saw a surgical failure in my practice? And they don't. For elective surgery, we go through this rehab process before surgery. Patients' outcomes are spectacular. Then we have this whole group of patients, even with bone spurs, that are cancer in the surgery because their pain disappeared. It wasn't because they were living with the pain, the pain actually disappeared. So I, I'm actually shocked. I had no idea. Every time that happens, which happens every week now, I just shake my head. I'm going, what's going on? So it's been very interesting. Hey, thank you for coming to talk with us. Um, I noticed that throughout your presentation, at no point in time, you mentioned the idea of physical therapy or any form of chiropractic intervention. Right. Um, I'm a big supporter of Dr. Stuart McGill, and I've read most of his. Dr. Who? Dr. Stuart McGill. Yeah. Yeah, so I've read most of his major works, and he's very much so on supporting stabilizing the spine right. and just getting comfortable in certain positions and then expanding from there. I was right. just curious on your thoughts on his work and why you haven't uh, been a proponent of physical therapy. Oh, I am. So I've put up the forest fire session. Normally when I give this talk, my goal today is to create this paradigm shift that you can heal yourself. I hope that came through. So it turns out that you have to address all the variables at once with sleep, stress, medication management, but physical conditioning is huge. So I'm a proponent of the weight room. I like acupuncture, chiropractic, physical therapy. It's been a wonderful thing for my physical therapist because they do their thing, but the book and the process takes care of the sleep, the stress, and whatever it is. So no, physical therapy is a huge part of the deal. Remember, everything works in chronic pain a little bit, but nothing works by itself. So sleep could be 25, 30%. Stress management could be another 30%. Physical therapy could be another 20, 25%. So when you start adding these things together, you know, it makes a big difference. So you're in good physical shape. So physical therapy probably for you is not as important as some of the other things of people that are grossly out of shape. So everybody has a different, I'll use the word formula because everybody is different. So by definition, if you're unique and I'm unique, which we are, then the only person that actually can solve my problem is gonna be me, right? I can't get inside your brain. So yeah, the physical condition is a huge, huge factor missing. That, and that's all in the book. Cool. Thank you. Thanks so much for your yeah. talk. Uh, I, I can uh, confirm that uh, taking stress out of your life uh, gets rid of chronic pain. I had uh, lower back pain for years. And uh, once I started taking out a bit stress of my life and you know, uh, uh, don't take work as seriously and to a certain extent um, really helped me. Good. Um, I have a question around adrenaline because it's like the, the, the um, talk about, uh, about adrenaline slightly confused me because uh, what is the right level of adrenaline or maybe what's the difference between adrenaline and dopamine? Uh, because for example, if I do a sport, you know, and I'm, I get an adrenaline rush, but the outcome is successful and I have a dopamine right. rush. Like what's the right balance? Because now I'm, now I'm a bit afraid to expose myself to too much adrenaline. And so I don't know what, where the right level. So I'll make it, again, I wish I had more time here. We actually, my wife and I do workshops together over a three or four day period of time. By the way, we're doing a workshop in New York this June 29th through July 1st, three-day workshop. It'll be on my website here shortly. Um, the reality is we don't really know the answer to that question. And so the goal here isn't trying to control things around you. In other words, I put that ring of fire out there because what happens, you become comfortable going back and forth through the ring. So the amount of adrenaline doesn't matter. So I, get, I probably have five times the stress I'm going to play right now than I had when I broke 20 years ago. So what happens is you just train your brain not to be adrenalized when you deal with stress. Because remember, stress by definition is a threat which is always adrenaline, otherwise it wouldn't be stress, right? So what you do is a lot of things that we perceive as stress, stress, which our thoughts are, a lot of us perceive stress, you start training your brain just to have less adrenaline. And so you quit avoiding stress, you really can just process almost anything. And I fail, I mean, I have some pretty bad weeks and stuff. So I always tell my patients to learn how to fail well because these pathways are permanent, you're always gonna be adrenalized, you always kick these things back up, but you just process them more quickly and more efficiently. Thank you. I guess one last question. Is that... uh, going back to the physical side, if you are working on your back, whether it be massage or physical activity, anything in particular that you do recommend, either massage-wise or specific exercises to strengthen the back? Yeah, I like them both. I mean, I think that things like massage, for instance, gives you a different set of sensations. So I think there's, first of all, a relaxation effect, which decreases the adrenaline. But you're also substituting neurological impulses from the part of the body that's painful. 
I love the weight room. Obviously, strengthening and conditioning helps. It also gives you sort of a mental approach that's proactive, pushing weights. But also, I think what you're doing, you're substituting, again, different impulses from that part of the body than pain impulses. So the weight room to me is a big deal. Pilates is a big deal. Um, so all those things, we call them somatic tools. That's what our workshops are, by the way, our somatic, somatic workshops, connecting thoughts with physical sensations. I think the exercise is one way of substituting different sensations for the pain sensations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I guess that's it. So thank you.